Good evening. Welcome to Vibrant Hong Kong. I'm Rico. Hello, everyone. I'm Mishi. The government launched Art March as a brand for the first time this year to promote a diverse series of arts events taking place in our city. Being the art lovers that we are, it's been quite a busy month for the both of us. Absolutely, Rico. Over the past four weeks, I've been to four exhibitions, two concerts, and three theater shows. I'm feeling very cultured after a month of intensive exposure to the arts. Although March is drawing to a close, there's no shortage of major events. The West Kowloon Cultural District Authority held the first Hong Kong International Cultural Summit earlier in the week to strengthen global cultural exchange and forge new partnerships through thought-provoking dialogues and discussions. And of course, there's also Art Basel Hong Kong, the largest international art fair in our city, which opened yesterday. Let's take a look at some of the highlights from these two events. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome all of you to the first Hong Kong International Cultural Summit 2024. Hong Kong will continue to expand our international networks under the one country, two system concept and establish ourselves as the East meets West Center for International Cultural Exchange. The first ever Hong Kong International Cultural Summit, hosted by the West Kowloon Cultural District Authority, has concluded with a resounding success. This three-day event witnessed the active participation of over 1,000 esteemed cultural leaders and visionaries from around the world. The Hong Kong as a our government attaches great importance to propel Hong Kong thrives as a cultural hub, and we are serious about this. This financial year, we will inject 180 million US dollars into our film development fund and 370 million US dollars into our Create Smart initiative, supporting projects in film, arts, design, and other cultural initiatives. The forum served as the opening ceremony for the 2024 Hong Kong Art Week, setting the stage for a vibrant exchange of ideas. Eminent speakers graced the summit and engaged in thought-provoking discussions on a range of topical issues concerning the future development of cultural districts and museums. These discussions delved into the transformative effects of emerging technologies on artistic practices and a highly anticipated plenary session on the contributions of cultural districts to the social and economic transformation of cities. One of the questions is, uh, what are the KPIs for backer cultural developments like ours? I think the KPI that I think will define success or failure for East Bank is around repeat visitation from local audiences. The thing that will sustain it and keep it going year after year is a sense of connection and ownership by local people. How do we make sure that we are reflecting in terms of our visitation are incredibly diverse, multiculturally and socioeconomically diverse communities. How are we reaching out in this uh, very large city that's rapidly uh, growing? So getting that kind of visitation and engagement is a, a, a really kind of core uh, KPI. Another important topic for discussion is the impact of emerging technologies on the global ecology of arts and culture. How will these technologies shape the future of arts and culture on a global scale? I think AI will completely change everything, including arts and culture. I think AI will allow us to go beyond our sometimes limited imaginations. But AI comes with possibilities, and possibilities will come with responsibilities. I think anyone working with AI I think also have the value ethics and, and how to make the systems transparent and explain as clean as possible. So I believe museums and artists together can have the role to explain the humanity as simple, as important, as depth and discourse and context can all be together. Uh, but it's a, it's a very heavy work, but I think it's possible. The summit was the inaugural large-scale international event of the Hong Kong Art Week. Another flagship art event, the Hong Kong edition of the renowned Art Basel, has also commenced.
the highly anticipated Art Basel Hong Kong, a pinnacle event in the art world, unfolded at the Hong Kong Convention and Exhibition Center from March 28th to 30th. Art Basel organizes annual exhibitions in Basel, Hong Kong and Miami, bringing together collectors, galleries and artists from around the globe. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm incredibly excited to be with you all here today. This year represents a true renaissance, with the fair resuming its full scale and ambition, and the city itself opening its doors to visitors from around the globe once again. 2024 is about reconnecting. Taking Hong Kong as the starting point and radiating out to the world. Art Basel Hong Kong showcased five captivating sectors featuring over 240 galleries from more than 40 countries and regions. This remarkable display brought together a diverse range of artworks, including iconic masterpieces from the 20th century, as well as works by renowned contemporary artists and emerging talents. This year's highlight is the Encounter Sector, showcasing 16 large-scale installations created by artists from different regions. Another focus is the Discovery Sector, which features solo exhibitions by emerging artists and explores complex issues surrounding urbanization and the transformation of public spaces in modern society. The film sector will also host 10 film screenings. Are you feeling the excitement of the art world already? Don't miss this opportunity to immerse yourself in art over the weekend. The government has set a goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. With buildings accounting for about 90% of Hong Kong's total electricity consumption and over 50% of our carbon emissions being attributed to electricity generation for our buildings, the implementation of green construction is crucial if we're going to reach this goal. To promote green building practices and carbon footprint reduction in indoor environments, the industry has created a set of standards to evaluate the sustainability of buildings. Today, we've invited Mr. Lee Ho Kin and Mr. Ho Chi Sheng, Chairperson and General Manager of Beam Society Limited, to tell us more. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure to meet you guys. Now, Mr. Lee, I understand that your organization is dedicated to the assessment of building sustainability. So, could you begin by giving us an overview of BSL's work in this area? Certainly. Um, we are Beam Society Limited. In short, we just call it BSL. Uh, we are an independent, self-financed, non-profit uh, public body. Our vision is to uh, promote uh, a sustainable community. Our work uh, includes uh, development and owning the Beam Plus uh, rating system. Our assessment includes the entire life cycle of the project, which starts from planning, uh, design, construction, and then commissioning, fitting out, and management and, and uh, maintenance. Other than that, we also provide uh, education for people who are interested in becoming green pro professionals and learn more about the green building technology. Wow, that's a very diverse and elaborate work scope. And it's almost 20 years that you guys have been doing a very great job. Now, um, HK, could you elaborate on the concept of indoor environmental quality assessment? We started by uh, establishing a rating tool for new building and then uh, existing building. But then we want to expand and think that uh, there's more to, to uh, cover. So we expand in two directions. One is uh, become a wider scope which we developed a, a neighborhood for a, a rating system, which in, includes spaces between buildings, outdoor spaces, and so on. And on the other hand, we also go into the smallest unit of a built environment, which is interior. We understand that uh, interior spaces are people work and live and do other things that they enjoy. So uh, it's important that we start from there. So uh, we, by... Uh, about 10 years ago, we launched the first version of Beam Interior, simply called BI. And it covers like a fitting out, renovation, or major alteration works. Last year, we have uh, launched a second version, which is an upgraded and improved version, which in incorporates the latest government standards 
and also the industry best practices. Now, thank you, HK, for your elaboration. CS, can you also give us some specific details of BIM plus BI version 2.0? Well, the BIM plus uh, BI interior 2.0 is a comprehensive and multidimensional tool. So may I draw an analogy? For example, if you are concerned about your health, mm. so you go to see the medical doctor to measure your health. So he will not just measure one single parameter, like, for example, blood pressure and so on. He will try to have some sort of what we call holistic sort of appraisal of your health. So likewise, for our tool. Our tool actually is very comprehensive. So, for example, for this studio, they will measure, number one is that what is the energy consumption, whether there is any measure to save the energy, and also measure about the water utilization, whether you take measure to save water, and then we talk about the air quality, and also even talk about the lighting, uh, the human comfort, and so on. So in simple terms, it is a holistic and comprehensive tool to appraise the different aspects of the interior. So it's almost like a full body assessment. Now, what types of premises is BIM plus BI version 2.0 applicable to? And how can interested parties apply for evaluation? So there are two part question. The first one is about, say, the, the, the building type or the built environment that the two is applicable. Then I, I would say the majority of the interior premises, spaces are covered. For example, shopping center, a foot hall, uh, institutional building, school, residential building, offices and so on. All sort of things are actually covered by our two. And as regarding the procedure, the procedure is quite simple. So the applicant, if they're interested, simply they approach the sister company of ours, which is called the Hong Kong Green Building Council. So they go there to do the registration and then pay a certain amount of fee, and that's it. And afterward, the whole thing will pass to the BIM Society for us to actually do the appraisal. So what the applicant needs to do, again, is very simple. They actually submit some sort of submittal. The submittal is already predefined. We define what kind of information we're after. For example, when you want to claim uh, energy mirrors. So they give us some sort of electricity bill to prove that you know, what you have done to save the, the electricity and also save water and so on. So the, the, all the paperwork will be appraised by ourselves and also by what we call the independent assessor, which you engage from the industry. And finally, the whole thing will be appraised by a cross-sectional sort of uh, panel, which represent the entire building industry. You have the architects, engineers, surveyors, and so on, and then you get the rating. And of course, uh, there are different sort of rating. The highest one is uh, platinum, and the next one is gold, and so on. So, I mean, as far as I understand, you know, many buildings are already constructed. So um, these assessments are kind of not mandatory, but it can be a voluntary process. So I would like to know, HK, what are the benefits of actually implementing these green building assessment programs? Uh, we can look at it at three different levels. Uh, from the macro level, uh, we all hear about climate change, global warming, uh, sea water rising, and so on and so forth. Hong Kong, although it's a small city, we only have 7 million people, but we still should do our best to uh, join this force of uh, combating climate change. From the micro level, coming back to talk about our buildings, our own interiors, we also should look at green and sustainable design because uh, as a whole, it would improve people's uh, health, safety, and well-being, and also the so-called happiness index, which is very uh, popular these days. On the third level, um, the cost of running a premises, a, a property, would be greatly reduced because you save in energy, you save in uh, garbage removal, uh, you release less air pollution, water pollution, and so on. And also in the long run, it will probably elevate the, uh, the value of your property. So it's all worth doing. Wow, very. There's a tons of benefits to that. And as you said, you know, it's important to have a longer vision to see into the future. <laughs> Well, that's great to know. Now, sustainable development has become an indicator in the construction industry in recent years, and some banks have even um, launched green mortgages. Now, only properties with green building certification are eligible for these products. Could you tell us a bit about that? Uh, we are very happy to know that uh, financial institutions, especially banks, are providing uh, green mortgage services, some are in a form of cash rebate and so on. The importance of uh, providing all these services is tied to a certain condition, which is the BIM Plus certification. So we are ha very happy to see that uh, it would really uh, improve the entire c community 
in terms of uh, improving the green and sustainable design. The results from the assessments actually uh, practically affect the development right. of the entire construction project. Now, CS, I would like to know, were there any references that you could draw on for the development of Beam Plus BI version 2.0? And how have the results or response been so far? Okay. We have been using the Green Building to assess for many years. So we actually look at the past. What are the feedback? So we got, and also what the experience. And then at the same time, we make reference to the international sort of tool. So we try to put all the tools available internationally on the table, and they will compare terms by term, course by course, and try to find out the best practice and also the best standard, which is most suitable to Hong Kong, and then form the tool. So therefore, to conclude, yes, we do make reference to a lot of things, including international standards and our own application experience. Mm -hmm. So I would assume the response has been quite favorable, yes. <laughs> I would say. Now, um, HK, um, can you tell us what's the overall outlook of the green building assessment industry in Hong Kong right now? We have uh, a very strong recognition and support from the Hong Kong SAR government and also from a lot of very uh, dedicated uh, construction professionals. And we are uh, seeing the uh, an increase in the number of projects coming in for certification. By January this year, 2024, we have a total of 2,550 projects uh, coming in for certification. And about 2,400 has completed the assessment. It's a very encouraging uh, numbers and we are seeing a lot more are coming in. And uh, furthermore, we, we don't just stop with the seven assessment tools we have. Uh, we are developing further on. We hope we can uh, extend our service into uh, like the Greater Bay Area or even further beyond that. Hopefully we can bring our message to a lot more people and uh, more and more will come and join the uh, the, the fight against uh, climate change. Thank you, uh, HK, and You're thank welcome. you, CS, thank you for much. giving us a glimpse into this world of sustainable building assessment. And we also look forward to seeing Hong Kong become a greener city with your efforts. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you very thank you much. much. Our next item is for all the pop culture fans out there. Complex Con is an event held annually in Los Angeles that brings together the world's most influential brands and artists in fashion, music, sports and more. Here are some highlights from the Expo's Asian debut. Super excited today because the internationally acclaimed pop culture carnival Complex Con is opening at Asia World Expo. This marks the very first time the event is happening outside of the US and numerous world-class fashion brand designers and renowned artists are invited to attend. I can't wait to see what's in store. Perfect. Can we also have you looking at our media friends at the back as well, please? Thank you. Thank you. Introduce us what Asian elements have been added to the complex called Hong Kong edition. Well, on our edition, we have a lot of different uh, friends coming here together. They show us that they are excellent items. So the Asian component, for example, we have an artist called Sam by Ten, and he has his creation that's all based on Hong Kong movie. What's so unique about Hong Kong that we have been chosen as the hosting city for the first Asian complex spot? And Hong Kong has a long history on culture. We actually been in the scene for a long time and we have a unique geographic situation where within five hours, half of the world's population is actually by air we can get to. And we want to prove to the world Hong Kong is still cool. Complex Con is a large-scale American festival that brings together pop culture, art, fashion, music and food. It has attracted tens of thousands of fans worldwide every year since its inception in 2016. First time in Complex Con China, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. What do you think of the scale and atmosphere comparing to the Complex Con in the US? The scale, it's, it's the same. The, the space is just as big, the, the booths are done up to the tip top but this is beautiful it's organized very well the lights are perfect what do you think of hong kong i love it here i love it here um it's so clean uh, did you know, uh, 
，气氛如何？全球的潮人都汇聚在了这里，而且是包括很多小众的品牌呀、艺术家呀，而且各种 IP， 感觉是一个潮流的汇聚地。I'm really excited because I've been knowing about this complex one for like a year. I didn't know it's this big. And the the turnout is amazing. People are so friendly. A lot of them from Guangzhou, from Samsung, they all show so much love. And then it's 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 good to you know to spread the word about like Hong Kong actually has a lot of good stuff going on. Yeah, I'm happy. Come down to Hong Kong. It's the best. The festival includes a marketplace featuring over a hundred overseas and local fashion brands. Jeff Hamilton, a celebrity fashion designer who has worked with megastars such as Michael Jackson, Madonna, and Kobe Bryant, is also among the lineup. Now, what's your impression towards Hong Kong's pop culture? Obviously, Hong Kong is, for me, one of the biggest capitals in the world as far as influence. You know, for me, Hong Kong is no different than than Paris, Milan, and London, and or New York. Digital fashion initiative can also be found here. Apart from showcasing collections by designers from Hong Kong and all over the globe, it has also set up AR chaos for visitors to try on different outfits. Do you think this look fits me? We're very happy to be in Hong Kong for Complex Con first edition. I think there is not many opportunities、um, for popular culture. You know, to get all together in a big scale, it's a perfect place for us to introduce the concept. Distinguished artists have also been invited to present their latest works and share the creative processes. Can you share with us a bit your impression towards Hong Kong's pop culture and art culture? I see a lot of American influence also. In Hong Kong, but a lot of people are definitely niching out their own way. With the use of AI being really common these days, do you think AI will become an inseparable part of visual arts in the future? Visual art comes with some poetry when it comes from the hand.、Mm -hmm. AI states the standard、um, basics of like methods. I know the mind, which is like Google. All of our brains are together. That's what makes a Google. Same thing as AI, but it would never have the passion that the hands have ever. This event has assembled artists and style icons from all over the world to bring visitors international pop culture, avant-garde artworks, as well as the latest fashion trends. There's no doubt it will act as a catalyst for global culture exchange. I'm going to check out the rest of the festival, so see you next time. In the previous part, we introduced a number of arts and cultural events taking place in our city as part of Art March. Some of the exhibitions and activities will continue running after the month is over, so there's still time to treat yourself to some multi-sensory offerings. That's right, Rico. For those who want to enjoy some outdoor fun or family time, there's the West Cape Fun Fest, which will be held at West Kowloon Cultural District until April 7th. This new annual festival features an array of performances and activities, promising a delightful experience for people of all ages. I'm sure we've all blown bubbles before. Fragile soap spheres are sights so exquisite yet ephemeral as they take flight. But here in West Kowloon Cultural District, there are these gigantic and mesmerizing bubbles that not only not vanish but also shimmer in a rainbow of colors. Visitor can wander and explore inside the bubbles and take pictures to capture the beautiful moments. This art installation is titled "Ephemero," created by the award-winning Sydney-based design studio Atelier Sisu. It is presented as part of the West Cape Fun Fest, which takes place between March and April at the West Kowloon Cultural District. In three, two, one, let's do it! Oh! The translucent, rainbow-hued bubble transforms with the sunlight. Enhanced by the lighting and sound effects, it creates a dynamic visual experience that evolves throughout different time periods. Our ephemeral collection was a piece that we created during the pandemic, where us in Australia, like the rest of the world, 
everything that we took for granted started to disappear around us and we really felt like we were trapped inside a bubble. And so the best way for us to articulate this feeling of a fragility and ephemerality was through the concept of a bubble, something beautiful and transient and momentary that is beautiful because you have to experience it in the moment. So is there a major takeaway that you aim for the audience, like a message to deliver? The idea of public art, we want to make it universally accessible. Um, and I think that the audience should really be able to interpret the art in any way that they do take away. We want to invite the audience to interact with the, um, the skin of the bubble itself and touch a real life bubble, come and experience it in the best way that feels natural for the audience. Um, and I think that that is in the importance of temporary art. Ephemeral has been exhibited in over 40 locations, including Sydney and Singapore. The Hong Kong debut includes Colossal, a site-specific new element specially designed for West K Fun Fest. We wanted to create something towering and tall. You know, Hong Kong is a really a hub of culture um, throughout all of Asia. We wanted to create something unique was complementary to this space. You know, the beautiful precinct here is defined by so many beautiful new buildings um, that's made with a lot of concrete. And I think the fragility of the bubble and the softness is something that contrasts with that um, and adds to the beautiful skyline. And how do you think about the West Kowloon District as a place to display and showcase its public artwork? And it's a space that invites so much interaction on a daily basis, from the, um, the cultural centres to the picnics on the weekend, through the park, um, through joggers on the weekend. Uh, we want the audience to come and experience the artwork throughout both the day and the night. We hope that there is a very soft ambient experience in the day where you can repose in the colourful shadows created by the artwork. And then in the night, there is a much more dynamic experience with the lightscape and the soundscape to create a different experience for the audience. Apart from the immersive art installation, West K Fun Fest also features various participatory performing art. Highlights include the Asian premiere of Zoom, an award-winning immersive theatre show for children by Patch Theatre from Australia. The festival also incorporates traditional Chinese culture, Xixu. Audiences can gain a deeper understanding of this traditional art form by enjoying performances of Cantonese opera by local young artists. There are many other exciting activities at the West K Fun Fest, so make sure to seize the opportunity and participate in this vibrant celebration of art and culture. In addition to a wealth of arts activities, our city also plays host to numerous sporting events. Speaking of, Mishi, are you going to get tickets for the upcoming Hong Kong Sevens? Well, I'm not a huge fan of rugby, but there's no denying that the tournament has become a locally and globally anticipated annual affair. Some people have even included the Hong Kong Sevens in their bucket list. The Hong Kong Sevens is a unique event in our city that combines sports, entertainment and culture. Let's see what's in store for this year's competition. The globally anticipated Hong Kong Sevens will take place from the 5th to 7th of April at Hong Kong Stadium. Top teams from around the world have been invited to the biggest rugby party on the planet. Having undergone a recent revamp, the series now sees 12 men's and 12 women's teams going head-to-head. -head. In the men's competition, France and Argentina are tipped for the title, while other strong contenders include Ireland, Great Britain, as well as traditional favourite, Fiji. As for the women's competition, Australia and New Zealand are the hot favourites, but France, USA, Canada and the dark horse Ireland shouldn't be overlooked either. In recognition of their shared Global Sevens legacies, Hong Kong China Rugby and Melrose RFC will exchange trophies for their respective famed Rugby Sevens tournaments. Named the Melrose Claymores, the trophies for the men's and women's teams in Hong Kong will be the crowning glory in a triangular tournament showcasing the best of Asian Sevens. The men's competition will feature China, Japan and host Hong Kong China, while China and Thailand will join Hong Kong China in contesting the women's title. The thrilling rugby action is sure to keep fans on the edge of their seats. The Hong Kong Sevens is an iconic sports and entertainment event in our city. And Chris Broke, chairman of Hong Kong China Rugby, is here to tell us more about this year's competition. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.
It's a pleasure to have you here, Chris. Now, the Hong Kong Sevens is just a week away, so there's a lot of excitement and hype going on. Um, how is the final preparation going? Yeah, preparation is going well. Obviously, it's a slightly hectic last week as we run into the competition, but uh, got very good attendance. Uh, so we're looking forward to getting probably a full house through the, the stadium over the three days, so 120,000 people. Sounds very eventful, so good luck for the coming week. Could you also tell us a bit about the history of Rugby Sevens of, um, as a sport, and how does Hong Kong fit into its development? Absolutely. So Rugby Sevens has a long history. It started in the 1880s in Scotland in a place called Melrose, uh, and it's developed through, uh, at the time, I mean, over time, it's really evolved in parallel to 15-a-side rugby, which is the sort of main game. Um, and Hong Kong has, has played a pivotal role. Obviously, we've been doing the Hong Kong Sevens now for 47 years, I think. So it's a long history. Uh, and over time, the Sevens has, has sort of showed the way in terms of how Sevens competition should work, I think. Um, and Sevens as a sport has developed in parallel to that. So uh, we now have a World Series. It's in the Olympics. Uh, and many people, it's a fast, quick game. And some people prefer it to the 15s game. Uh, it's a different style, a different type of skill needed. So evolving very quickly um, and becoming more and more popular. Yep. Mm, it's definitely a um, sports event that everyone looks forward to every year. So in your opinion, what are the factors that have contributed to the success that it enjoys today? Yeah, it's obviously evolved from a, a relatively small event 47 years ago, which had, I think, 3,000 spectators at the football club. Um, and I think it's a combination of factors, I think, that have made it successful. I think the, the quality of, of the rugby is great, so people enjoy watching a very high level of sport. Um, but I think the social aspect is very, has become more important. And I think over time, um, that sort of unique piece in Hong Kong around the blend of, of sport, social, business, corporate hospitality, uh, it's become a big event for everyone to attend and want to attend, and also a focus event where people can arrange business events, company events, you know, friends can come and visit. So it's become a real sort of focus in that way. So I think it's a combination of all those factors. People, some people ask us, you know, what's the secret ingredient? I don't think there necessarily is one, but I think it's, you know, a lot of people have worked very hard over the years to, to build all those uh, th factors together to create what mm -hmm. it is today. I mean, it's definitely like years in the making. And I would say that on social media, that actually plays a huge influence as well, especially for fans who are not particularly into sports. They know about the Hong Kong Sevens and they see it as like a festival. So it's really fun to participate in. Correct. And I think, you know, we've, we've been very focused on social media over the last, uh, well, five years at least, but probably before that as well. And I think our objective there has really been to obviously increase the exposure of the tournament, get more people aware of rugby, um, but also, you know, use that to introduce the game to new fans, people, as you say, who are perhaps not so familiar with the game, but would like to come and watch, experience it, and get the atmosphere of the tournament. And you guys did a great job. How do you think the event has influenced the development of rugby, the sports in Hong Kong? Yeah, well, it's been absolutely critical to the evolution of the game here because I think the majority of the revenue of, the, of Hong Kong China Rugby comes from the seven, so we reinvest all of the surplus proceeds into the game. So that's allowed us to invest in... Uh, community rugby, schools programs, youth pathways. So we wouldn't have been able to do a lot of that without the, the funding, so that's been critical. I think the other element is it, it, it obviously is a very high-profile event and it allows people to look at role models and think about, well, you know, maybe I could play at the Sevens sometime. Um, and in fact, many of the players that represent Hong Kong China at the Sevens have come through our youth system. Mm. So they started playing mini rugby and then came through youth rugby and then ended up playing for Hong Kong. So there's some great stories of people that have done that. I'm just also very curious as to whether more <laughs> girls are joining this yeah. sport now. Absolutely. Uh, girls and women's rugby is the biggest growth area of the game. Um, and Hong Kong China Rugby, we're very focused on investing in that. Um, the representative teams that, um, that we have in Hong Kong, uh, both men and women, actually the women's teams are slightly higher ranked in the 15 side. Um, so yes, you know, we are very uh, focused on that. And, as I say, it's probably the fastest growing area of the game. And I'm just curious to know, um, what are the ages of the youngest players to start training in rugby? Well, mini rugby, I, th I think technically you can't start till you're about six years old. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, there's, there's some very young boys and girls running around the pitches every Sunday. Um, so yeah, a lot of people do start very early. Uh, obviously, that's it's non-contact at, at that stage. And then they gradually get more into the contact game mm -hmm. as they get to sort of 10, 11, 12, that type of age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Now, going back to the Hong Kong Sevens, um, how many overseas teams are coming this year? And can you tell us about some of the hot favourites? Sure. So 
Hong Kong is we're part of the World Series. Um, there are eight tournaments this year on the on the series. We're, I think this is the fifth leg, Hong Kong. Um, so we've got uh, twelve men's teams, twelve women's teams coming, um, and it's the, that's part of the World Series. In addition, we have um, two smaller competitions we're running for uh, the men and women for Hong Kong. So Hong Kong, uh, the men will play against Japan and mainland China, yeah. and the women will play Thailand and China. So. Um, We'll, uh, it, I guess in total we'll have 30 teams playing. Um, and in terms of the hot favourites, on the men's series at the moment, Argentina and Ireland are the two standout teams. But we'll, we always have the more traditional teams of New Zealand, Fiji, Great Britain, others. So it's, it's, they're very, it's very close, very competitive. Um, and on the women's side at the moment, um, most of the series uh, events so far have been either won by New Zealand or Australia. So those are the sort of favorites on the women's side. You know, having all these other teams, you know, coming from other countries and gathering here, it's really cool to not only see the sports, but also the showcase of cultures. Because one year I've been there, you know, I, I saw the war cry and it was such a cool thing. Yep. So yeah, the All Blacks will do the haka, Fiji will do their, yep. uh, so there's a, uh, no, I mean, I think there's always a fun element to it as well. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of the players really enjoy coming to Hong Kong. It's mm -hmm. on their sort of, must-do list, so like their bucket they, list, they right? really is on the bucket list. They really want to play in Hong Kong, so when they come, they, they really enjoy it. Oh, I'm glad they love Hong Kong too. Furthermore, the sevens was mentioned in the recent government budget because it's believed that major events of this kind can generate synergy and also drive consumption as well as related economic activities. So do you expect next week's tournament will help boost the local economy? Uh, I think so, definitely. I mean, I think if you look at the numbers that we, we did some surveys before uh, the pandemic on the economic benefit of the sevens, and we were at that point looking at um, about 400 million Hong Kong dollars for the weekend for hotels, F&B, restaurants, etc. And I think we'll definitely see some uh, increased sales in restaurants and bars next week. Yeah. I do want to know when similar major events are hosted overseas, uh, do the organizers or travel agencies offer accommodation packages to um, attract tourists? And what can Hong Kong leverage to stay competitive? We're also looking at, we always look at other tournaments, see what we can um, garner in terms of best practice. I mean, as you probably well know, it's, it's all about the experience. So it's about not just the sport, but the entertainment and uh, the, the whole sort of festival atmosphere of the weekend. So we do look at that and, and I think, you know, the entertainment that we put on, we're trying to keep as diverse as possible again to, to make sure it covers a broad cross-section of the audience. And this year we'll, we'll have Arnold Pineda, we'll have the Whalers, so we'll have Lolly Talk, the Canto Pop Band. Um, we've got other types of, we've got a DJ who's a former England rugby player. Mm -hmm. So we've got all sorts of different types of entertainment, um, which I think, again, helps with the appeal. Um, and, and I think it's also, again, about people coming, taking photos, enjoying themselves with their family and friends, as well as enjoying the sport. If you look at the UK, Europe and other places, I think, yes, it's, it's about how to integrate um, the entertainment piece, but, all, but, but not alienate any type of spectator, because there'll always be the, the purest spectator that just wants to come and watch the rugby. So it's making sure you create a good balance and uh, something for everyone, I think, is the key. Yeah. That's right. Now, this year actually marks the 30th year of the Sevens at the Hong Kong Stadium. So has anything special been planned to commemorate this special occasion? Yes, we've had um, a number of social media campaigns um, with 30 sort of greatest hits, which has been very well populated by people's experiences over the last 30 years. So we've had sort of the tourism board supporting that. We've had spectators, clubs, key opinion leaders all, all contributing. So that's been very successful in terms of looking back over the 30 years. We've got some uh, rugby ambassadors from coming um, who played in the sort of historic times. Now, location-wise, the Hong Kong Sevens will have a new home at Kai Tech Sports Park next year. So what changes will there be with the relocation? Yeah, I think it'll, it'll obviously be a different experience because it's a, a, a totally new facility. It's a precinct versus just the, the standalone stadium. There's some new experiences we can develop. Um, but at the same time, we want to make sure we don't lose the inherent atmosphere of what we've created um, in Sokum Park. Now, will you miss the Hong Kong Stadium? There's a lot of nostalgia around the stadium. Yeah. I think we've all been there many times to watch the Sevens, um, and we will miss it. But I think the the opportunity is there to look at the Kai Tak Sports Park and see what we can do to improve the experience for fans and for the players. So um, we're looking at it in a positive way. But again, we'll look to be, um, I guess, saying farewell to the Hong Kong Stadium in the right way. How can Hong Kong conceive more of these iconic events that carry the local stamp? 
Yeah, I think uh, Hong Kong has a lot of benefits. Obviously, it's a, a transport hub. People can get here easily. It's a very convenient city to come to and travel around. Um, I think the Kai Tak Sports Park will, will give additional momentum to that because we'll have more facilities available. Um, and I think it's really a question of just promoting all those benefits and the convenience and the, the experience that people can have in the city. So I think it has a lot of benefits on that front. Lastly, what do you want the world to remember about the Hong Kong Sevens? <laughs> Yeah, it's a difficult one because there's lots of things that we'd like them to remember. But I think, um, you know, Hong Kong has become an iconic event on the Seventh Circuit. And I think it's on everyone. We talked about bucket list earlier. I think it's on every, everyone's bucket list to get to the Hong Kong Seven. So I think really, as I say, we're just at the moment they're sort of building on what a lot of people have put in over the many years. Um, and I think we all constantly just want people to remember that the Sevens here is the best Sevens tournament in the world. I think that's the key thing. So thank you, Chris, so much for giving us an insider's perspective on the Hong Kong Sevens. We wish you all the best with the tournament thank next you. week. Thank Good you luck. very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Let's keep the ball rolling with another sports feature. The 2024 Hong Kong Snooker All-Star Challenge recently took place at Queen Elizabeth Stadium Arena. Some of the game's greatest players, including Ronnie O'Sullivan and local legend Mark Fu, showcased their skills and strategies as they vied for the competition title. The 2024 Hong Kong International Snooker All-Star Challenge showcased thrilling exhibition events over three days at Queen Elizabeth Stadium. The tournament featured world-class players such as Ronnie O'Sullivan, Judd Trump, Mark Williams, Jack Lazowski, Marco Fu, and Si Jia Hui. Well, personally, I'm a big fan of snooker. We are focusing on promoting the non-mainstream sport in Hong Kong. That's why we brought all the stars coming over for a snooker match. And we would like to see how it is done. We'll learn about its history um, from how snooker is being maybe being recognized as a bar sport, similar to darts, to the international status now. This year's highlight was the much-anticipated showdown between Rocket Ronnie O'Sullivan and Hong Kong snooker ace Marco Fu on the opening day. The second day of the challenge saw world number one O'Sullivan face off against Judd Trump, who currently occupies the world number two spot. Trump wowed the audience with a perfect 147 maximum break in the sixth frame and ultimately emerged victorious with a score of 5-2. Marco Fu and Jack Lazowski both enjoyed the game and hope to see more world-class snooker tournaments take place in our city. Uh,其实我都一直觉得香港人都挺喜欢出球这个运动,即是这么多年有,我小小个知道我依家打出这么多职业,其实每一次香港做这些大型活动,希望观众看得开心。其实我也一直觉得香港人都挺喜欢出球
Very, very happy. Absolutely fantastic. It's my first time to see a live show on uh, snooker games. Yeah, I did. I just got a photo of uh, between Mark and uh, Ronnie. So, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. That's a, 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 tr a treasured moment. I think we're really, really, yeah, really blessed here. Yeah, really and nice. It's good for Hong Kong to get some really top national sport here. It's good for the country. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, the Asia community really uh, follows a lot the snooker and they, they like legends like this coming to town to uh, show them their skills. Yeah. The Leisure and Cultural Services Department has joined hands with the International Art Collective Team Lab to present the Team Lab Continuous Exhibition at Tamar Park and the Central and Western District Promenade Central Section. Hundreds of luminous, color-changing installations will adorn this part of the harbour front until June 2nd, creating an immersive, magical experience guaranteed to thrill the senses. Before taking you to the seaside spectacle, we would like to wish everyone a... Happy, Happy Easter! Easter.